Hello, everyone. I'm uh, very delighted to be here. Uh, I'm kicking off the smart contract section here, and I'm going to be talking about uh, a mechanism for smart contracts to finalize on Bitcoin and how Stacks is making that possible. Uh, so a little intro about myself. I'm Marvin Jensen. I'm the, uh, well, former technical lead at the Stacks Foundation because actually now I'm working with something called the Clarity Innovation Lab, where we're trying to push the boundaries of what we can do with Clarity smart contracts. So a few of my affiliations here that make sense. Uh, Stacks Foundation, the Clarity Innovation Lab. Um, way back when, I did a little stint with OpenSea, so I have some experience with these kinds of DeFi protocols, and I'm very excited to be working on new kinds of novel mechanisms in Clarity smart contracts. So what I want to talk about today uh, are a few things. I want to give a very quick introduction of what is Stacks, for those of you who haven't heard it before. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of the consensus mechanism of Stacks, which is called proof of transfer. Uh, then the bulk of it, uh, I'll be talking about the Clarity smart contract language. Uh, I will give a, a short introduction to post conditions as well, and uh, a quick snapshot on overview of some projects that are currently building on Stacks. I'll talk a little bit about uh, Clarity as a language itself. So Clarity is a language that is, uh, it looks like a Lisp style programming language, for those of you who have used Lisp before. and. Uh, they really tried to reinvent this from the ground up. So they looked at all the existing languages that were out there and you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, they looked at languages like what were some good points about languages uh, and what is some stuff that we could do better. So uh, Clarity is the result of uh, a little labor between then Blockstack as well as Algorand. Uh, they jointly developed this language, which uh, I'd love to show you more about once I can go to the next slide. There you go. So what is Stacks? Um, the short summary of, stack, of Stacks is that it's a blockchain that is connected to Bitcoin. So it uses Bitcoin for its finality, meaning that uh, the block commitments are written to the Bitcoin chain. So it is connected to Bitcoin and it writes its Bitcoin uh, block, uh, the Stacks block commitments to the Bitcoin layer. So this gives it uh, a public visibility uh, that other chains usually don't have. So it creates this mechanism by having a new consensus mechanism called proof of transfer that allows stacks to connect to Bitcoin in such fashion. So that means that Bitcoin is a necessary component uh, for this mechanism to work. So Bitcoin is chosen, of course, as the base layer because Bitcoin by far is the most secure chain, has the highest hash rate, the highest level of security. So Stack leverages this security by um, utilizing this consensus mechanism. Uh, then it invented a new smart contract language called Clarity. So as I mentioned before, this is a Lisp-like language that has a few different properties. So this is not an EVM-based chain. Uh, it has its own Clarity virtual machine that runs Clarity code. Um, Stacks has a mechanism called post conditions. So post conditions will allow you to assert the chain state at the end of a transaction. So this uh, gives you an additional safeguard to protect user assets. Uh, and I will talk about that a little bit more later. And what I think is the most unique property of all of this is that uh, Stacks uh, gains direct read access to the Bitcoin chain. So that means that a Bitcoin transaction can trigger something on Stacks. So you can tell if a Bitcoin transaction has been mined, uh, you can use that as a trigger to make something happen in a Clarity smart contract, which is uh, quite unique. So proof of transfer, uh, showing here the mechanism. So this is the overview. Proof of transfer has uh, two sides. So on the one side, there are the so-called stackers. On the other side, there are the miners. And what happens in this mechanism, as, as you might have guessed, the name proof of transfer implies uh, there's a transfer of some sort of asset. So we are all familiar with proof of burn, but the people that originally created Blockstack, they thought like, well, we can do better than that. Why waste this, this underlying asset that is being transferred? And thus, proof of transfer was born. So let's take a quick look at the minor side here. So for miners to be able to mine Stacks blocks, they, they need to do one thing, and that is transfer Bitcoin. So as a Stacks miner, you will run a Bitcoin node as well as a Stacks node, but you don't have to actually mine Bitcoin. So that means that you don't need the same kind of powerful processing that you would do for uh, Bitcoin mining. 
So instead, you just transfer Bitcoin, which is just sending a transaction. So in this example here, uh, if miners want to bid to become the next leader or block producer, what they do is they commit uh, an amount of Bitcoin to the network. So in this example here, say that we have three miners. Uh, the first miner commits a 0.3 Bitcoin, the second miner commits 0.5, and the third miner commits 0.2 Bitcoin. So that gives us a total of one Bitcoin, and that will mean that uh, by this weighted function that the, the second miner will have a 50% chance of becoming the next block leader. So it uses a verifiable random function to decide who's going to be the next leader based on this Bitcoin commitment. Right? So once the leader is then elected, this, uh, this miner or block leader will then earn the right to produce the next block and can do so um, afterwards. He can also work on so-called micro-blocks that have uh, blocks that can be produced in between. Uh, why is this important? Well, since we're inheriting the security properties of Bitcoin, we're also inheriting some of the other properties. So think block time, right? Bitcoin has a 10-minute block time, so this gives Stacks a 10-minute anchor block block time. So for us to get uh, some faster confirmations, uh, a microblock mechanism works that, so that allows you to confirm some transactions in between these blocks. So once a new anchor block is produced and then it's a block commitment published on Bitcoin, a new stacks block is created, new stacks are minted and the miner is rewarded with the Coinbase reward plus the fees. So then on the stacker side, so the users that already have uh, these stacks gas tokens, they can lock these tokens in for one or multiple cycles. And then de depending on the amount they lock, they can either choose to stack individually or they can stack in a so-called stacking pool. So what stacking allows you to do is submit a Bitcoin address uh, towards a reward slot. So stackers that lock their tokens to signal the, the longest chain tip, uh, the, the tip that they have the most confidence in, uh, will allow them to re receive a, a yield in terms of Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin that we talked about earlier, the miners sending this Bitcoin into the network, the recipients of that Bitcoin are the stackers. So that means if you have stacks, you can receive a, a native Bitcoin yield in your Bitcoin wallet. So this is not a wrapped asset, it's true. Bitcoin that you'll be receiving. So that's an overview of proof of transfer for technical deep dive. I will have is a resource available at the end. So let's jump into clarity, what we want to talk about here. So the clarity smart contract language, a uh, little bit different from the languages that you might have seen if you've done Solidity or you've done Rust or one of the other languages that you've been using. Uh, so clarity, first of all, is an interpreted language. It's not a compiled language. So compare this to, for example, to Solidity, right? Solidity is compiled to so-called EVM bytecode, and that is what is actually committed to the chain in a transaction and what will be executed, right? There's this additional step of a compiler involved. So with Clarity, that's not the case. It's actually an interpreted language, which means that the code that you write is exactly what is committed to chain. So this gives it a few uh, useful properties here. You see a screenshot of the block explorer right here. Uh, with a trade contract being deployed. So you can pull that contract from the chain and you can retrieve it exactly as it was written and committed to the chain by the original creator. So this gives you a lot more transparency than some compiled smart contract languages do. Right? You might have experienced that you go uh, connect to uh, adapt on Ethereum, you send a transaction, but this contract does not have a verified source on Etherscan. Uh, and, and you're not exactly sure what you're sending this into, right? There's a degree of trust there, so with Clarity, you can always pull the original contract that you're interacting with from the chain. A uh, second property is that Clarity is a decidable language. It's uh, non-turn complete on purpose, which means that uh, things like gas estimations and gas limits are, are, do not come into play because you can analyze the entire contract call uh, statically before you actually send a transaction. So that means that you can know before you send a transaction what the maximum amount of runtime cost is going to be. So that's very useful because you don't run into an unbounded loop, you don't run into the issue where uh, you run out of gas. You, you might have heard that phrase before. Next property is that uh, re-entrancy is not permitted on the language level. So re-entrancy is uh, a situation that has caused a lot of grief in, in the blockchain uh, or the whole crypto ecosystem because uh, it allows for mechanisms that usually the developers of smart contracts don't intend, right? So here's an example. Uh, there's a contract A, uh, the user calls into the first contract, contract A calls into a contract B, and contract C 
will receive a token, but will call back into contract A, thus uh, re-entering into the same function. So this has led to loss of funds, right? Balances are being updated, even though uh, that was not the intention. So clarity does not allow re-entrancy on the language level. So if the static analysis shows that this would be a re-entrant call, it is rejected. Next property here is that also on the language level, there are no overflows and underflows. So an overflow happens when a number that you're trying to store uh, reaches its maximum value, and then if you try to increment it, it will wrap around and become the minimum value, and the underflow is the other way around. So this is also something that we have seen in languages like Solidity. It can lead to issues that will either uh, freeze a protocol or will allow an adversary to drain a lot of tokens that wasn't supposed to happen. So Clarity does not permit this. If you try to do this, here's an example uh, in the interpreter, uh, you get an underflow runtime error, the transaction will abort. Uh, next, Clarity has support for custom tokens built in, so it becomes easier for developers to define their own fungible tokens as well as non-fungible tokens, and these events then are part of the blockchain events. So when a new token is minted, you can very clearly see that happen, and you can then protect these with post conditions, which is what we're going to talk about soon. Uh, so post conditions, as I mentioned at the start, these are assertions that happen after the entire transaction completes. And if these assertions fail, the whole transaction is rolled back. So this gives you additional form of security. And finally, another important one for the smart contract developers among us, uh, every response in a clarity call must be checked. So what this means is that if a contract calls into uh, another contract, there's an inter-contract call, you have to deal with the return value of that call. So there are languages where you can ignore that value, you can just make that call, uh, not care about the return value. In Clarity, that is impossible to do. You need to handle that response somehow. So that means if the, the contract that you're calling into errors out, then uh, it, that transaction will roll back if you don't handle that. So I want to give you a very quick overview of what a Clarity smart contract then looks like. So here is a contract that implements a so-called uh, SIP009 NFT. So this is the equivalent on Ethereum, the ERC721 NFT. Uh, you can see that with quite a little bit of code, uh, just 41 lines, you can implement a functional NFT. So I'll zoom in on that because some of you are far away. Uh, so looking at the top here, we see some interesting things. We see some constants are being defined. That's not very exciting. But then on line 12, we see this define non-fungible token stacks is uint. So this is basically saying, I'm defining a new NFT that has this identifier called Staxis, uh, and that is identified by an unsigned integer. So basically, every token ID is just a number. But you can come up with any sort of uh, interesting uh, structure or, or complex type if you so desire. Um, and then there's some functions here, right? Like you get the token IDs, the token URI, so where you store your metadata. And then down here, uh, we have some functions to actually make this NFT work. So we have a transfer function, and you can see that there's functionally only two lines of code that are required. So line 29 will check, is the transaction sender equal to the person that wants to move the token or the address that wants to move the token? And if so, we do an NFT transfer of this taxis token from the sender to the recipient. So you note here on line 30, this NFT transfer is one of these built-in functions that make it a lot easier for developers to create their own NFTs. Um, finally, a mint function, uh, just for convenience to see like, how you can mint an NFT and how you can make some assertions based on that. So um, I want to talk a little bit about post conditions here and why these are very important. So I showed you earlier that you can define your own NFTs. So why would you use this over just re-implementing this yourself? Because in the end, this, this NFT call that I just showed you is just, uh, you could say, defining a balance sheet, right? You say, like, here are my tokens, here are the token IDs, and here are the owners. So you can quite easily just write that yourself. Why would you use these build-in functions? Well, if you use these build-in functions, you get access to the post-condition mechanism, which allows you to protect your end users from adversaries or smart contracts that will try to do something nefarious. So what post conditions look like here is imagine Alice is making this contract call and she sends a, a, a contract call to an NFT contract and says, hey, I want to move this, this NFT that I own with an ID of 1234 from myself to this other address SP123. Then 
you can just send that transaction and have that happen. Uh, and, and with an NFT contract, you know, if you're just calling directly into the contract itself, that will be okay. But imagine that you're calling into a marketplace contract or something else, something that is more complex, right? So Alice can actually attach a post condition and the wallet will do this for her. Uh, that will state like, at the end of this transaction, I will have sent exactly one NFT with this ID 1234 uh, to this address SP123. So then the contract call is broadcast to the network, it's picked up, it's mined, uh, the NFT contract code is executed, and that will mutate the chain state, right? It will update the balance sheet to the new owner. So then the post condition check is gonna kick in, and it's gonna check like, did the ownership of that NFT actually change from TX sender to this SP123? If that is the case, then the changes are actually materialized on chain, and the transaction is successful. If that is not the case, then the transaction will revert. This is very powerful, even though post conditions are quite simple, so you can do this with NFTs based on token IDs, you can do this with amounts, so if you have a fungible token, you can say this transaction is going to send exactly 5,000 of these tokens. Uh, and there's a few rules that you can apply there. So you can say, oh, I want to send at least 2,000 or no more than 6,000. And these, is all, uh, these are all things that you can capture in post conditions. Um, if you go on the Stacks chain and you go to the Explorer, you will also see this every now and then. So when you go to the Explorer, uh, you see the contract call, you see the source code with it and um, it will state like, hey, this transaction would have succeeded, so it was successful, but it was rolled back because of a post-condition check that has failed. And this has uh, saved a lot of assets from, from being stolen and uh, has been a very powerful mechanism so far. So using these custom functions will allow you to also use these post-conditions. Uh, so a quick overview of some of the uh, uh, applications and projects that are building on the Stacks ecosystem. So this is a snapshot of last year. Uh, you can see a lot of different projects here. So uh, we have btc.us, which is like uh, an ENS equivalent on the Stacks chain. So you can register .btc names and there's .stx names. Um, I'm trying to find, we have also uh, Alex, which is a DeFi uh, suite. So they're building uh, the equivalent of say Uniswap. They have Compound, they're creating an order book DEX. Uh, so think about ZeroX protocol that is being built that is on their, on their testnet right now. Uh, we have, let's take a look, uh, secure blogging as well. Uh, we have integrations with many uh, large chains as well. Uh, and, and continuously new projects are being added and building on top of stacks. What is very interesting to us is that we have seen novel projects also utilizing the consensus mechanism in new ways. So there's one project uh, down there, Arcadico. Uh, they created a lending protocol where you can borrow USD at a negative interest rate. So it's a loan that repays itself. So how do they do that? By utilizing stacking. So the stacks that you commit to the vault, they will stack that. The Bitcoin rewards are then used to pay off that loan. Uh, so very unique and they're utilizing proof of transfer to make that happen. So very interesting. Uh, finally, I want to highlight City Coins real quick. You might have heard of that one before. So they launched Miami Coin and a few different coins. They created uh, a mechanism called Proof of Transfer Lite, where they created a token that functions the same way as Proof of Transfer, and will then also utilize uh, the consensus mechanism. So some resources here, uh, the Stacks API resource you can find up here. Uh, Clarinet is a, a main development tool. Compare this to Truffle, you can use it to test your contracts, write unit tests, uh, check syntax, uh, do all sorts of things, even run interactive console sessions. So you can start a local Clarity session and just type the code as you go along because this is interpreted. If you know one of the, the great powers of Lisp is that you have very good REPLs, uh, that's Clarinet for us. There's a Visual Studio Code extension that also connects to Clarinet, so that makes your development flow very, very easy. It can spin up a local dev net in a single click. You can test your contracts, you can restart, makes it very easy. Uh, Explore can be found there. And then finally, MicroStacks, uh, an interesting library that's built by an ecosystem partner to make everything stacks very easy. So you can compare this to Web3.js or Ether.js. 
And, and we've reached the end here. So if you want to learn more, please do scan this QR code. It'll lead you to stacks.co, where you can read all about stacks. You can uh, find a deep dive on how proof of transfer works. Uh, Clarity Language, if you're interested in that, claritylang.org. Uh, we offer free courses as well. So if you are a beginning developer, fret not, you can join us for free course. You'll have mentors and teachers. Uh, we have courses on Code Academy that you'll get access to, and you can you know, play around, try, try what you will. Uh, we have a grants program, so if you uh, have a good idea and you want to have this built, that's a way for you to find funding. There's even a Stacks Accelerator, so if you uh, get a team together and, and you have a, a great idea for something that really makes sense on Stacks, uh, come talk to us, talk to the Accelerator, we'll be happy to hear you out and ha help you get started. So please, uh, join the free course using that link, and uh, hopefully I'll see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation, a detailed presentation, and you heard the man. Um, feel free to join and ask away if you have any questions. And in fact, we do have some questions um, right in front of you, I think that you can see. Uh, the current dApps within Stacks ecosystem are not as popular as other blockchains for now. Um, are there any new plans to introduce killer dApps? Uh, yeah, so as I said earlier, uh, the snapshot that I showed you was from, from maybe a few months ago, last year. So we have since seen many new projects, and new projects are, are being built every day. Uh, so yeah, popularity, you know, we can see that we had some very strong presentations earlier as well. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that nothing is happening there. So, so Alex is building very interesting things. We have Arcadeco, uh, and there's a few other projects that are currently being built. Uh, there's a strong emphasis on DAOs, because these DAOs are also inherently public, thanks to Clarity's design. Uh, so we see a big push there. So uh, there's a project called Stacker DAOs. They're making these one-click DAOs that will then settle on Bitcoin, so you can leverage the security of Bitcoin to do your governance. Uh, but there's, there's, there's too many to list, yes. there's. More stuff coming, for sure. Well, thank you for that answer. So there's more to come. Um, I think we have time for one more. How advanced is Stacks in terms of security? Um, are there any fundamental security systems in place to prevent hacking? Yeah, so uh, good question, very broad question. So I mentioned a few things already. I said we have post conditions, right? So these, these help a lot uh, to prevent uh, nefarious smart contracts from uh, transferring tokens uh, that the user didn't intend. Uh, but then looking at uh, maybe more the blockchain layer itself. So Stacks writes its block commitments to Bitcoin, which means that the Bitcoin chain state, if you will, is public on the Bitcoin chain. So the side effect of this is that if you're trying to attack the Stacks chain and you want to mine a fork, right, and you want to uh, create a fork with more work and to have that replace it, you have to do that publicly on the Bitcoin chain. So it's very easy for the network or for everyone to see like, hey, someone is mining this fork that is not the canonical chain tip here. Uh, so I think that that is very interesting as well. And then uh, to compound that, if you want to reorg the stacks blocks, you would also have to reorg Bitcoin, which uh, sounds like a, a tall order. So I would say that there are very various uh, security practices here that are very interesting. Um, but as to the question is, of course, in the end, developers also need to build good applications. We try to make that as easy as possible, but there's a very active developer community that you can join. It's on Discord, and uh, they will love to help you out as well. Well, thank you very much for that answer. Um, I think we have our last question here. Do you have any plans to support other mainnets for final uh, uh, finality options? Uh, I love that question. That's that's very good because uh, you know internally we we refer to the Bitcoin chain as as the burn chain or the base chain. So you can already hear that that uh, even though Bitcoin was chosen, Stacks doesn't necessarily have to depend on Bitcoin. It could maybe depend on another chain. And and this is not something I'm personally involved in, but I've heard these conversations where people talk about like, hey, how can we connect this to say Ethereum or even Dogecoin? So since Dogecoin <laughs> is a fork of Bitcoin, they said like, hey, can we not build? Uh, a programmability layer on top of Dogecoin like this. So I've heard that uh, people are talking about these things, but I'm, I'm not personally involved. So uh, as for the plans, I think the main chain is definitely going to stick with Bitcoin because of the security problems of Bitcoin, of course. Well, thank you for your answers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please give him another big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.